Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Hello and welcome back to The Voice Fiend. Let's talk about books, baby. My reading this year has been very on and off. I'm either binge reading books at a rate of one book per day, or I am letting my Kindle sit on a shelf and gather dust for weeks. There is no in between. My Goodreads goal was to read 30 books in 2021, and so far I have read 15, so I think I'm doing pretty well. In this video, I'm going to tell you about the highs and the lows of this experience and rate every single book that I've read so far this year. And the category that we're starting with is fiction, because there are only two books in this category. I do not read enough fiction. The first book is The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. So this was the winner in the fiction category in the 2020 Goodreads Choice Awards. Basically, the concept of this book is that there exists this library somewhere where every single book is an alternate way that your life could have gone had you made different choices. When you pull a book from the shelf, you're transported into that alternate world at the age that you currently are. So I am 20 years old right now. Let's say I wanted to find the book where I decided to stick with my childhood dream of being an astronomer. So I would open the book and bam, I get to experience what life would be like as a 20 year old in college studying physics or astronomy. I don't even know what that career path is. I would say it can be a pretty heavy read emotionally, but it is kind of quick and light in that there's not a lot of characters or storylines to keep track of and I don't think it's very long either. But the message is very powerful though. I feel like maybe part of the reason why it won in the 2020 awards is because that was a year when everyone was feeling very uncertain and wondering, did I make the right decisions in life? And I think this book delivers a very comforting message that yes, you did make the right decisions. Don't worry. So yeah, thousands of people on Goodreads loved it. I loved it. My friend loved it. Her roommate loved it. Five stars. The next fictional book is Ask Again Yes by Mary Beth Keen. So this was definitely longer and more complicated than The Midnight Library, but I really enjoyed it. It follows these characters back from young men training at the police academy all the way through when they got married, had kids, something really bad happened to both of their families, and then eventually their kids have kids. I really like the central love story. It was beautiful but also not perfect and so it felt realistic. They had family problems, mental health problems, substance abuse problems. So this one is also quite a heavy emotional read, at times very dark, but it is very, very moving. So five stars. And now we move on to the excessively large nonfiction category. The first book is Smarter, Faster, Better by Charles Duhigg. I don't know. This one felt kind of disjointed. It was just a bunch of techniques listed one after the other. It kind of felt like one of those listicle blog posts, but very, very long. Basically, the thesis in this book was like, here are eight techniques that will make you smarter, faster, and better. Some of the things applied more to working individually, other things to working with teams, still others to managing other people. And so at the end of the book, I was just like, I don't really know what I'm supposed to feel or do. I think my favorite part of the book actually was the ending where he talks about how he has applied these eight techniques to his life and tips for how to apply them to yours, but it felt like an afterthought. It was literally called Appendix, a reader's guide to using these ideas. Like, shouldn't the reader be guided to how to use these ideas throughout the book? I don't know, I'm not telling you how to do your job, I just, that's a suggestion. Three stars for this book. The next book is The Bullet Journal Method by Ryder Carroll, and I know I have said that bullet journaling is not really my thing, but I read this book for research purposes. I felt like, as a personal development YouTuber, I should brush up on my stuff and know about all of the techniques that are out there, and I wanted to learn more about the method than just looking at pretty bullet journal spreads on Instagram, because while they are beautiful, they don't really show you how the system is utilized on a day-to-day -day basis. It's written by the creator of the bullet journaling system, so it's pretty much the most straight from the source guide that you can find. It first lays out the rules of the system and then <clears throat> each chapter will explore guiding philosophies from a variety of traditions and teach you how to put them into practice with the help of your notebook. I really, really liked it. I thought it was a great reminder of why we do all this planning stuff in the first place. And even though I don't want to bullet journal, I felt like there were tips and advice that I could pull from it and apply to my own system. I tweeted this quote from the book. I rarely tweet but I tweeted this. 
Anyways, we briefly interrupt this episode about books to bring you a message brought to you by Squarespace. So as you probably know already, the Bliss Bean was created and is hosted on Squarespace. By the way, the Bliss Bean just turned three years old. Squarespace is the perfect place to make a website for your blog, online store, resume, anything. It has everything you need in one place, including blogging features, email marketing, e-commerce, and lots of analytics data for you to delve into. So let's look at mine. Oh no. Yeah, usually people look for personal development content at the start and the end of the year and then maybe at like the beginning of the school year or something. So I think that's normal, right? But so you can use this sort of information to know your audience better and to grow your business. So for example, I had a blog post all the way back in 2018 titled 15 Creative Uses for Empty Notebooks that did surprisingly well. So I decided to remake that as a video in 2021 and that got almost 100,000 views. So you can head to squarespace.com for a free trial and then use my code, the Bliss Bean, for 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. All right, Burnout by Emily and Amelia Nagoski. This book is obviously about burnout and stress. It's mainly directed at women. It talks about things like how to complete the stress cycle, why it's important to have connection in our lives, how a big reason that women have this stress and burnout in their lives in the first place is because of the patriarchy and because of something they call the bikini industrial complex. So I like this book, it was a good book. I think mainly I was confused about the structure. Part two was titled The Real Enemy. That was the one that talked about about the patriarchy and the bikini industrial complex. I don't know why it was sandwiched between parts one and three. I don't know exactly how parts one and three were different, which I think made the message less effective. Sorry. Four stars. The Richest Man of Babylon by George S. Clason. Clason? I don't know. I like to imagine it's French. Clason. Croissant. <laughs> This book basically tells the fictional story of this guy named Arkid who became the richest man in Babylon. It's a good book, super repetitive, but good. Basically, all it says is save 10% of what you earn, don't trust advice from people who don't know how to manage their own money, and invest your money. That's it, there you go. You don't need to read the book. It won't have any confusing terms like when I open up Twitter and my brain explodes because I don't understand cryptocurrencies or NFTs. This is basically just common sense, very, very straightforward financial advice. Four stars, I guess, I don't know. Bad Blood by John Carreyrou. You guys, this book was fascinating. This book is the story of Elizabeth Holmes who dropped out of Stanford because for some reason everyone thinks that getting into a good college and then promptly dropping out of it is the path to success. Anyways, she dropped out of Stanford. She started a company, a startup that created blood testing machines. It was called Theranos. This company came to be valued at $9 billion. But the problem is, this teeny tiny problem is that their product basically did not work. It was all an illusion. It was a mess. So for example, when investors would come to visit their company and want to try out this magical blood testing machine, instead of having the machine display an error message as it normally would because it was not working, they had it display a super slow progress bar. So they could basically be like, sorry, it's taking really long for some reason. We can end the meeting and we'll send you the results afterwards. And then as soon as the investors left, they take out the blood sample send it to an actual blood testing lab and then send them those results. It really does read like a thriller even though it is a non-fiction book. So, five stars. One star to Elizabeth Holmes. She's kind of a terrible person. Alrighty, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. The title says it all. That's exactly what the book is about. The problem is I read it way too quickly. So I think this book made some great points. I just don't really remember what those points were. Pretty much all I remember from it is this quote, remember that a person's name is to that person the sweetest and most important sound in any language. I'm definitely going to reread this book, but four stars for now. The next book is Dear Girls by Ali Wong. I was introduced to Ali Wong by my mom because my mom is a really big fan of her Netflix comedy specials. I thought they were okay. I wasn't a huge fan of them. So I actually misunderstood the entire concept of this book. Before I read it, I thought Dear Girls, Girls was referring to just all the world's girls for some reason. But Ali Wong actually has two daughters named Mari and Nikki, and this book is sort of a series of letters to them, to those girls, her girls. In the beginning of the book, she actually says, Mari and Nikki, do not read this book before you are 21, because it is, there is no filter. And obviously I read the book when I was 20, 
I heard you like bad girls. Well, I read Dear Girls before I was 21. Even though it is very raunchy, it was very entertaining. I liked it a lot. I liked the afterword by her husband. Some people said it was cheesy, but I love that stuff. Bring on the cheese. Five stars. Building the Intentional University edited by Stephen M. Coslin and Ben Nelson. So you may have heard of Minerva University. It has been kind of trendy on YouTube. It is the university that Unjaded Jade attends. It's probably most well known for the fact that students literally like all pack up and move together and study in seven different cities around the world throughout the course of their four year program. And fun fact, I became really, really obsessed with this university for a very short period of time. I honestly was about to apply there even though I've made two tuition deposits and one housing deposit at IE University. I was ready to throw all that away. But in the end, I decided that I could not handle moving around so much. I also could not handle the academic rigor, um, especially now that I have my YouTube channel. So I decided against it, but in that brief period of obsession, I wanted to learn everything about it. So this book is basically a guide by the people who created the university about how they did that. It's really cool to see how people are innovating and transforming the education space. I guess I'll give it four stars. It accomplishes its purpose. It is kind of boring, but it's not supposed to be interesting. So I don't know if it's fair to take away a star for that, but this is my video, so I get to rate it however I want. Let's move from education into politics. This is The War on Normal People by Andrew Yang. This book was just randomly available at the library, so I picked it up. I really did not know any anything about Andrew Yang's platform um, on which he was running for president in 2020. All I knew basically was that he wanted to give people a thousand dollars a month and I was like, what? How? A thousand dollars? But after I read this book, I finally understood how universal basic income might work and why we would do something like that. One of the things that really stuck with me from this book was he described the median American. So basically, if you took everyone in America and you lined them up shoulder to shoulder based on their education, wealth, and occupation, and you took the person right in the middle, that person would have a high school education and be living paycheck to paycheck. And that was just a shocking reminder of my privilege and also the bubble that I live within like you can live in a section of America and just have no idea how the rest of the country actually lives one of the recommendations he made in the book was that he would like to see every high school student have the opportunity to take like a fully funded gap year after they graduate to live in different parts of the United States with host families and just get to know how different types of people in the country actually live. So I thought that was a great idea that probably won't happen, and universal basic income is also a great idea that probably won't happen. Great ideas, I just really hope we actually get to see something like that in the world. Five stars. Talking to Strangers by Malcolm Gladwell. So I gave this book four stars because I remember thinking that the central point just didn't seem as clear or strong as the one in his other book, Outliers. I actually did not take notes on this book, but if I were to write a summarizing statement, I'm trying to think what I would have written. Like we are very easily fooled by people and not as good at judging intentions as we think we are. I don't know, I did enjoy reading it. I like how Malcolm Gladwell's books take all of these stories that are crazy and seemingly unrelated and then somehow sort of weave them together in order to prove one point. But after doing some Googling and interneting, it would appear that I am the one who is too trusting. I tend to take things at face value, especially when I read books. I'm just like, yeah, this all makes sense. I agree with this. No need to cross check it. But apparently Malcolm Gladwell has a lot of criticisms, especially for this book. So with Talking to Strangers specifically, people have criticized the way that he handled the issue of sexual assault in the book. They have pointed to the lack of a thesis in the book and other issues. So with the input of other smarter people on the internet, I have decided to downgrade this book from a four to a three. Alrighty, it doesn't have to be crazy at work. That's the title of the book. It doesn't have to be crazy at work by Jason Fried and David Heinemeyer Hansen. So this book is basically a collection of short essays on how they run their company, Basecamp, in a calm rather than a crazy way. The people who brag about trading sleep for endless slogs and midnight marathons are usually the ones who can't point 
point to actual accomplishments. It's pathetic. They are not messing around and I love it. The extent to which someone reading this can apply their advice to their own life varies. If you are working in a lower level job position and the people managing you insist on a crazy style of work, you probably can't just give them a copy of this book and be like, let's do things this way now. Stop emailing me in the evenings. But I do really like the points they presented and it's a very short and punchy read. So four stars. When Breath Becomes Air by Paul Kalanithi. This book was incredible. This was also Goodreads Choice Awards winner in 2017 in the Memoirs and Autobiography category. So Paul Kalanithi had nearly completed his training as a neurosurgeon, something that takes like 10 years to do. He was 36 years old, he and his wife were about to start a family, and he was diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer. As you might expect, this is a really sad and really heavy book to read. It's very thought provoking. That question of what do you do when you are told so suddenly and so early in your life that your life is going to end. As someone who really likes having a plan and having a general direction that I know my life is going in, this quote really resonated with me and it really painted a picture of how lost and directionless Paul felt in his life. Definitely five stars for this book. And finally, the last book is A World Without Email by Cal Newport. This one didn't quite hit the spot for some reason the way that deep work and digital minimalism did. And I think that is because I myself, I guess luckily, have not truly experienced the kind of work environment that Cal describes in this book. So the book actually really isn't against email necessarily, it's more against what he calls the hyperactive hive mind. Like yeah, I still use email and yes, it's sometimes slightly annoying, but for the most part, I spend my day in focus blocks of scripting, shooting, editing, and and I'm not interrupted that much, so I guess I'm just not really the target audience for this book. But I love reading about how email makes us less productive and miserable, Cal's words, not mine, and also about how we adopted this technology, very similar to the way we adopted social media, which is very quickly and without thinking about the long-term consequences, and it kind of ruined the way that we work these days. So overall, not my favorite Cal Newport book, but I still liked it, I do recommend it, four stars. As a final note, these are are two books that were really very good, I just for whatever reason did not finish them. I read about half of each, so technically I read 16 books this year, not 15. So thank you so much for watching this long ramble about books. Here's to more good books for the rest of 2021 and reaching 30 books by the end of the year. Bye!